page 23. Question 18. Explain the title of the play, The Rivals. Who are the rivals? Answer. The title of the play is not a suggestive and comprehensive one. It does not convey the basic theme of the play or the attitude of the writer. Such titles as School for Scandal or She Stoops to Conquer carry the suggestion of either the social theme or the theme about private individuals in the play. The Way of the World suggests a broader theme of the play by way of indicating the ways of the world typified in the relations and intrigues described in the play. But the title, The Rivals, does not carry any precise relevance. It has been suggested that by this title, Sheridan refers to the pseudo-rivalry between Captain Absolute and Ensign Beverly. Captain Absolute and Ensign Beverly are the same person. But to Lydia, the heroine, they are different persons. She makes love to Ensign Beverly because she has romantic fondness for a penniless soldier. But she cannot love and marry a rich heir because she is opposed to conventional marriage by a parish priest. She dreams of elopements, love in a hut, etc. The kind of things that she has read in sentimental novels. Captain Absolute, the son of Sir Anthony Absolute, is, however, offered for marriage with Lydia. Absolute, knowing the romantic temperament of the woman, woos her in the disguise of Ensign Beverly. So the main intrigue of the drama depends on the mistaken identity of the hero. The revelation of the true identity of Ensign Beverly is a great disappointment to the heroine. She is, however, reconciled and at last married to Absolute. There are two other contenders for the hand of Lydia. They are not treated as serious rivals. They are broad comic types. Mrs. Malaprop, Lydia's aunt at first, wants Bob Akers to marry Lydia. He is a countryman trying to live up to the city life. He is good-natured but awkward. He uses a new kind of swearing. He has taken dancing lessons. He tries to be a daffer gentleman and thus qualify himself for the hand of Lydia. But he cannot hide his essential nature. He proves himself a coward when he is faced with a duel. He promptly withdraws from the duel when he comes to know that he has to fight with his friend Captain Absolute. Sir Lucius is another rival. He carries on love intrigue with Lydia. But he does not know that the letters meant for Lydia are really delivered to Mrs. Malaprop, who replies under the name of Delia. Thus, there is the clandestine correspondence between Sir Lucius and Mrs. Malaprop, but Sir Lucius has the illusion of making love to the pretty Lydia. He also challenges Captain Absolute to a duel when only he comes to know that he is his rival. He resembles the traditional braggart soldier. Sir Lucius and Bob Akers are contrasted to heighten the comic interest of the play. Question 19. Discuss the importance of the Falkland-Julia episode in the play The Rivals. Answer. Julia Falkland episode in the play forms the subplot. It is frankly sentimental and is there in the play to parody the sentimentality of the sentimental comedy. Sheridan makes much fun of the sentimental foolishness of Falkland. The subplot, however, moves in separate courses. There is no interlinking device for joining the two plots. In Shakespeare's plays, the subplot is linked up 
by a character apart from its relevance to the main plot by parallelism and contrast. Page 24 But in The Rivals, the action jogs and jostles on without much order, amid the surprises of a two-fold plot by the aid of expedience and reconnoitrous reconnoitrous without the full and regular government of a dominating idea. Yet the Falkland Julia episode, in spite of its separate entity, has relevance to the drama because of the contrast to the main plot. Julia offers an interesting contrast to Lydia and Falkland does the same with regard to Absolute. Lydia is fantastic, giddy-headed, dreaming of romantic elopement, rope ladder, a coach and four drive to Scotland. Her imagination feeds on absurdities collected from romances and sentimental novels. Julia, on the other hand, is a sober, serious girl who can fix her affections on the person she loves to whom she is bound by gratitude and by the instructions of her father. Her constancy, her devotion to Falkland, her common sense, all these offer contrast to Lydia's frivolous and whimsical temper. Julia entreats Lydia not to allow a man who loves her sincerely to suffer from her caprice. Julia is sometimes annoyed by the caprices of Falkland and bursts into tears, but in spite of sentimental effusions, Julia never rejects Falkland. Falkland and Absolute are contrasted. Falkland is capricious, suspicious, always dissatisfied, and ever prompt in discovering new ground of dissatisfaction and suspicion. Absolute is cool-hearted and full of common sense. He retains his cool temper even in the midst of the romantic absurdities of Lydia. But Falkland curses himself as a fool a barbarian who has thrown away a precious jewel. Sheridan shows his designing faculty by reversing the roles of the characters in the subplot. The romantic Lydia has her counterpart in the sentimental Falkland in the subplot, while the cool-headed Absolute has his counterpart in the sober and serious Julia. The subplot throws the main plot into relief. The love in the main plot has its even movement which is ruffled by external troubles. The course of love receives a setback when Ensign Beverly is revealed to Lydia as Captain Absolute. She is disappointed for a time but at last accepts him as her husband. But in the love episode of the subplot, characters themselves make a lot of troubles. Their dispositional contradictions create setbacks for them. Question 20. What is malapropism? Give some examples of malapropism from the rivals commenting on the errors involved. Answer. Sheridan has the credit of giving a word to the English vocabulary that is malapropism. M-A-L-A-P-R-O-P-I-S-M It is derived from the from the most amusing trait in the character of Mrs. Malaprop. She is very fond of using words and phrases which are quite wrong in the places where they are used, but somehow they suggest the meaning intended by her. This ludicrous misuse of word, especially for one resembling it, may have its origin in Shakespeare's Dogberry and Verges, two constables in much ado about nothing. But Sheridan had the genius of creating a new, a stock stage figure and give that figure vitality by her ridiculous misuse of the words. Mrs. Malaprof's very name points to her main characteristic. The name Malaprof is a convenient English form from the French Malapropos within quote. It is the characteristic of Mrs. Malaprop to overwhelm all her 
quote, sorry, to overwhelm all with, quote, her select words so ingeniously misapplied without being mispronounced, unquote. In her discussion with Sir Antony, the topic of female education, Mrs. Malaprop gives her opinion in memorable words. Page 25 Quote But above all, Sir Antony, she should be mistress of orthodoxy, that she sh might not misspell and mispronounce words so shamelessly as girls usually do, and likewise she might reprehend the true meaning of what she said. This, Sir Antony, is what I would have a woman know, and I don't think there is a superstitious article in it. Unquote. Her own language is an unconscious comment on her learning and pretension to use classical or learned words. She used orthodoxy for orthography, reprehend for apprehend, superstitious for superfluous. Absolute in his letter to Lydia, intercepted by Mrs. Malaprop, refers to her, quote, ridiculous vanity, unquote, and to her dull chat with hard words, quote, which she don't understand, unquote. But the most amusing condemnation of her vanity comes from her own mouth when she says to Absolute, quote, Sure, if I reprehend anything in this world, it is the use of my oracular tongue and a nice derangement of epitaphs. Unquote. Thus, here she uses reprehend for apprehend, oracular for vernacular, derangement for arrangement, Epitaphs for epithets. In analyzing malapropisms, the gradation of shades and various ways in which she departs from the accepted use of words are worth examining. Out of enthusiasm to be recognized as an intellectual, she sometimes uses words that are quite high sounding, though they do not serve any useful purpose. She uses ineffectual for intellectual or exhort for escort. There is another variety of malapropism that seems to be quite dominant in the play. Use of words which sound a little alike and differ by a syllable or so. For example, laconically for ironically or progeny for prodigy. But the height of absurdity involved in these malapropisms is to be seen in the use of words that sound alike but convey just the opposite of the intended meaning. Malevolence for benevolence. Act 1, Scene 2. Other amusing malapropisms are felicity for velocity, parasite for parricide, P-A-R-A-C-I-D-E, parricide for Parricide, P A R R I C I D E. Delusions for allusion, pine apple for pinnacle, punctuation for punctiliousness. Mistaken use of words is by no means a unique device, but Sheridan's use of it displays considerable ingenuity and creativeness. The malapropisms are not only amusing in themselves, but also the source of much dramatic irony. Question 21. What, according to you, is the most amusing scene in the play, The Rifles? Give reasons for your answer. Answer. There are many interesting and amusing scenes in The Rivals, from the point of view of fun and farce, Many scenes are memorable. In each scene where Mrs. Malaprop appears, she throws the audience into hearty laughter by her nice derangement of epitaphs. That within quote. The scene in which Captain Absolute, with a mock serious anger, reads his own letter to Mrs. Malaprop is farcical and funny. Towards the end of the scene, that is Act 2, Scene 1, in which Absolute refuses 
to woo the girl of his father's choice as cursed and threatened by the angry father the presentation is highly entertaining act 3 scene 1 is equally amusing absolute with mock humility and show of penitence dupes his father into believing that only out of paternal regard he is ready to accept the girl of his father's choice as his bride in this scene we are introduced to falkland who talks about julia to captain absolute we get to know the peculiar sentimental quality of falkland he is given to understand that julia is in good health he concludes that julia is insensitive she should have been in bad health because she is away from him this sentimental disease is a source of amusement again in this scene we come to know bob acres who is not yet successful in his attempts to imitate city life city manners his clothes manners as well as his new method of swearing provoke laughter acres's information to falkland that julia is caught as merry as crickets unquot throws the latter into a fierce mood of sentimental moroseness page 26 this scene act 2 scene 1 is particularly amusing for giving us different varieties of humor fags smug lying at the beginning is a source of fun his nervous utterances quote i forget the precise lie you may but you may depend on it he got no truth from me yet with submission for fear of blunders in future i should be glad to fix what has brought us to birth unquote make the audience have a roaring laughter falkland and acres between them create a comic situation acres with his imitative manners of a city man with his swearing and artificial language and falkland with his sentimental poses create a lot of fun the scene between father and son set off the old man well and is full of comic irony for all these reasons the scene scene 1 act 2 is in my opinion the most amusing scene question 22 discuss the second prologue and comment on what sheridan says here in the play the rivals answer the play the rivals has two prologues in the revised form the first of the two prologues to this play was written for the op- for the opening performance the play was not a success because of the choice of the actor for the part of otriga he was too villainous destroying the comedy and offending the irish after 10 days he was replaced and sheridan composed another prologue in the first prologue a little skit gives a sergeant at law the opportunity to develop the idea that he pleads the case of the author and that the members of the audience are the jury that will pass judgment the device is amusing but the basic idea is by no means new The second prologue is more interesting. It was spoken at the 10th night. It was spoken at the 10th night. Sheridan, while expressing his views on what comedy should be criticized, quote, "The goddess of the woeful countenance," dash, "the sentimental muse," unquote. He makes a comparison between comedy and sentimentalism. Comedy contains humor. quaint and sly amorous hints coat light masks or covers satire strokes stroke or hides the conscious blush her wit provokes unquote the comic muse sheridan says is not formed to preach or be grave the sentimental muse's emblems are the pilgrim's progress and sprig of rue she is too chaste to look like flesh and blood and having made her votaries weep a flood she will end her comedies in blood these things are not fit for comedy which is too light to teach morality or virtue they are subjects for tragedy sheridan points out that quote 
grey experience, unquote, and solemn sentiment within quotes, which abound in sentimental comedy, do not suit the, quote, youthful form, unquote, of comedy. The main purpose of it should be entertainment, provocation of laughter through wit and gay invention. Sheridan thus deplores the characteristics of sentimental comedy, the characteristics which defeat the very purpose of comedy. He condemns its preaching tendency, its lacrimose elements. He asserts that comedy should appeal to the audience through its gay inventions and wit. He pleads for the revival of comedy which declined at the hand of the writers of sentimental comedy. As a matter of fact, in The Rivals, he revives the comedy of manners by presenting a satiric picture of the artificial manners of the 18th century society and by depicting the eccentricities of characters and their interacting relationships with witty dialogue and funny situations. He satirizes the sentimental comedy through the sentimental exaggerations of Julia Falkland episode. Page 27 Question 23 What part do the servants play in the rivals? Answer One very important element in the construction of the rivals is the use of servants. Sheridan uses the servants as, uh, as very important agents for the revelation of the plot of the drama. These servants of the rich middle class or aristocracy of the 18th century were often shrewd observers of the manners and secrets of their masters and mistresses. These servants play an important part in the drama as retailers of information and commentators on the doings and behavior of their masters and mistresses. In the very first scene, we are introduced to the main action of the conversation between Fag, Captain Absolute's servant, and Thomas, Sir Anthony's coachman. There are four servants in the play, Fag, Thomas, David, Bobaker's servant and Lucy, the maidservant of Lydia. Servants are comic types since Aristophanes. Servants are common, sorry, servants are comic types since Aristophanes. They have traditionally been shrewder, more practical, more worldly wise and more realistic than their masters. Sheridan differentiates the servants. Fag and Thomas serve as chorus by their observations and comments about their respective masters and their doings and plans. They are clever enough to see their masters as secrets and their foibles. Fag and Thomas are differentiated in the very first scene. Fag is a man about town and is conscious of his superiority. Thomas is a country coachman of his master. The former therefore assumes a superior pose. Fag assumes the mannerisms of a gentleman. He talks of Absolute's activities as if he himself were the principal character. He talks of fashions as if they were created for him. He considers himself as a sophisticated man and condescends to the country coachman. They are, however, witty and their remarks reveal their strong common sense. Fag lies and he admits he is a liar in practical affairs. He tells a lie to the father of his master in order to save his master. He worms out the secret of the proposed match between Captain Absolute and Lydia and hastens to convey the happy tidings. He is gay and witty. David, unlike Fag, is an unsophisticated servant of Bob Akers. Fag imitates the ways of a fop, but David is simple. He has a countryside culture and is not pleased with the shoddy glamour of Bath. He has plain views on duel and dress and a contempt for the gentleman's code of honour. David is devoted to his master and is keen to protect him against the dangers to which he exposes himself by his folly. David tries to dissuade his master from the duel. David is thus a contrast to Fag in his countryside manners and views but both are devoted to their masters. David, however, does not have the cunning of fag. 
Lucy is the cunning maid who extracts money from different clients by keeping their secrets. In the first scene, we have a short glimpse of Lucy taking tips from Captain Absolute. She is a go-between, a schemer and a skillful liar. She is loyal to nobody. Sheridan uses her shrewdness for ironic comedy. Mrs. Malaprop says of her, quote, The girl is such a simpleton, unquote. But actually she turns out to be a shrewd woman, duping and betraying all. She is the mischief maker who delivers the letters of Sir Lucius meant for Lydia to Mrs. Malaprop and thus dupes him into believing that Lydia is in love with him and dupes Mrs. Malaprop into believing that Sir Lu Lucius is in love with her. She is responsible for complicating the situation. She is an unscrupulous maid.